I think what a lot of people don't know about Panda is that we're a family business. And I think the unique role that Panda plays is that we were the first taste of Chinese food for many in the U.S. What I say about Panda is we are the largest mom and pop Chinese restaurant in the world. And our cause has everything to do with being American Chinese and everything to do with creating opportunities for people. Well, I was born in China, and I grew up in Taiwan, and spent about four and a half years in Japan before I came to the uh, United States. I was born in Burma, raised in Hong Kong, and came over here for college education. My husband, after graduate, he came over to California to open a restaurant with his father. So, Panda in was built in 1973. When we first started the restaurant business, I thought it would be a lot easier to make money. Oh no, it wasn't like that. The first month, we did like $12,000. That was like 400 bucks a day. You know, I used to make a couple hundred dollars just as a waiter. My father was front of the house and greeting guests. My grandfather was back of the house and he was making food for the guests. My mom, who was already an electrical engineer, would come and be a hostess on the weekend. And there was my grandmother and my uncles and my aunties and they'd all come together to really support this family business. So in terms of growing up as part of this panda business, what I knew about business was that business was going to be about family. Because of Panda Inn, we got invited by the developer of Glendale Galleria to go and open a restaurant in the mall. And that is when I really start to look at the possibilities. Because mall is actually a new thing at that point in time. We do our very best how to provide the, the food that we have. We really have to focus on great food, great service, and great ambience. I took what we served from Panda Inn and simplified it and made it work at the uh, uh, Pan Express. I remember when we started, we had the longest line, I, I would say longer than most other restaurants. I find it, oh wow, this is quite good and it was easier to do. And I went all over the place to open restaurants. My parents have done this incredible job. They came to the U.S. with nothing and they were able to build a business that's now a household name. But when it comes to the second generation, what does that mean? What does it mean to honor the legacy, the foundation that they've built? but also what does stewardship look like for the second generation. Many of us that embody this duality and ethnic identity, when we were growing up, maybe it was being a little apologetic for the ethnic sides of our identity. And we at Panda are saying, hey, no, we are unapologetically American Chinese so that the next generation coming up can say, not only are they not apologetic and unapologetically American Chinese, but they are celebrating their ethnic identity. I think what's really important to recognize is that anti-Asian hate isn't new. Because of appearance, because of fear, Asian Americans, AAPIs, may be labeled as forever foreigners. And then it begs the question, well, if systemic racism exists, what is the role that we can play? What can Panda do? And that's where we launched the Panda Community Fund. And it is a five-year commitment of $10 million and likely to continue. But really what it is, is looking into our communities, identifying those local and those national programs, the people that are already doing fantastic work to help the victims of racism and violence, to help those that are already amplifying and educating people about the beauty and diversity of the U.S. and supporting them in their work. American dream is really defined by individual uh, differently. And for me, it's actually that you're content with what you have and, and also able to make a, you know, a good citizen in the community. I think being the beneficial 
uh, of the uh, United States and being educated here. Uh, people in the Chinese community or maybe Asian community, we all know that we have to give them back. As a second generation, as we look to the third generation, I think what it means is if we're moving from survival and stability to a level of stewardship and celebration, the American dream means how can we have the freedom to honor the past and honor origin, but also have the freedom for original expression. Only in America, you know, you get to do this. And also, I think I'm very proud that we did it right. You know, we work with our people, we took good care of our people. You know, we make sure that in our ability that they grew. Our job really is to continue to figure out ways that our people can prosper. How do we pay them more? How do we uh, make the work easier and more functional and you know, how do we get people to come back frequently over and over again? So do every little thing, do them exceptionally well. It really is about modeling. We don't manage people. We lead them. We lead them by setting an example. This is how you could do like I have done. When our people grow, our business will. Guy Fieri is cable TV's highest paid chef, pulling in an estimated $26 million a year. Fieri was born, sans the frosted tips, in Columbus, Ohio in 1968, but was raised in Ferndale, a town in Humboldt County, California. His parents were veggie-loving hippies, managers at a Western clothing store. When Guy was 10, he got his first entrepreneurial taste of the food business. He created the awesome pretzel cart, that he would take to fairs and rodeos, where hungry crowds would devour his soft pretzels. As he got older, he continued to work in the food and beverage industry, paying his dues as a dishwasher for a Mexican restaurant. He saved up enough money to become an exchange student in Chantilly, France his junior year of high school. We're guessing he consumed a healthy amount of baguettes and brie there, because he continued to follow his passion for food after graduation. He studied hospitality management at UN Las Vegas and managed a few restaurants before finally opening his first one in 2006, Johnny Garlic's in Santa Rosa, California. Hi, I'm Guy Fieri and welcome to Around the same time he opened that, he sent in an audition tape to be a contestant on the next Food Network star. Guy! And went on to win the whole thing, securing him his first show. Back then, Food Network's audience was mostly middle-aged females and the network hoped Guy Fieri's huge personality would draw in more male viewers. Flames and Grease brought in the dudes, and when Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives premiered in 2006, Guy joined the elite club of celebrity chefs. He wasn't a snobby chef screaming at people. He was a regular guy that ate burgers and dive bars, and America ate that up. Guy was a full-on character and an instant magnet for memes. The internet went to work creating a Guy Fieri meme for almost anything, which only made him more famous. But the network could have never imagined the magnitude of the show's success. The laid-back dude had a magical draw. His fame led to Guy Fieri cookbooks, the Guy Fieri Roadshow, and Guy Fieri Salsa. Since then, he's hosted more than 14 series on Food Network and Triple D is still on the air more than 15 years later. This is where things go off the rails right here, folks. Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives generated more than $230 million in ad revenue in just the last year. And Guy recently signed a contract with Food Network, which will pay out $80 million over three years, a $50 million raise from his prior agreement. His name is attached to 80 kitchens worldwide, and he has a delivery-only business, Flavortown Kitchen, as well as a new chain, The Chicken Guy. Not to mention Santo Tequila, which he owns with former Van Halen singer Sammy Hagar. And while he's not doing all of that, Fieri and his family make time to give back to the community, to restaurants, to the troops, and more. All in all, Guy is a pretty big deal. There's this crazy funding boom going into creating meatless meat 
and alternative proteins because we really need to change the way we eat. And one of the hardest types of proteins to find and one of the kind of last areas that hasn't been getting as much funding but has recently having a lot of investors flocking to it is the world of alternative shellfish and seafood. New Wave Foods is an extraordinary company, mission-based uh, with a huge business opportunity. So the co-founders saw that there were tremendous issues in the uh, supply chain for seafood, particularly for shrimp. 90% of what we consume being imported and over half of that from shrimp farms. So there was tremendous ecological damage that was happening through these farms. And it's the number one seafood. So Americans consume a billion and a half pounds every year. So it was a big business opportunity, a big ecological opportunity. And that's what really formed the, the company at its inception. It is extremely hard to recreate a shrimp without shrimp that still has the same snap that's expected from a shrimp and the same, you know, fresh out of the ocean to taste. But there are several startups that have been really trying to perfect it and spending years in research and development and food engineering to try to make it happen. And we were really lucky to get a chance to taste some that has been getting worked on for a really long time is about to get commercialized and sold in cafeterias and restaurants and even maybe grocery stores soon. So uh, we got the New Wave shrimp here, and those go into this uh, rice flour. So they get a light dusting of rice flour, they go into this special tempura batter that is also is gluten-free, made with bean, potato, and rice starches. Um, and then it goes into 360 degree oil, and it fries really nice, uh, very delicious. And then I've got Japanese brewed organic soy, ginger juice, and mirin is the little dip, uh, and some uh, wakame salad. Well, what we're offering is a one-for-one -one swap, and it's used exactly as shrimp is used in any recipe. Uh, we particularly recommend hot recipes, so entrees and appetizers, and it's delicious. When I met the founders, they had a wonderful idea, and they had a good they had a very good product, but there was definitely areas for opportunity for improvement. So we stepped back, and that's when, about three years ago, we went to the Culinary Institute of America, and we started working with master, certified master chef Brad Barnes. And what we did was we, we pulled together a really extraordinary team to work on it. So we, we had people from academia, we had leading food R&D folks, we had some of the flavor houses from around the world. So we really kind of punched over our weight and collected an extraordinary group of professionals who worked on this to really create the texture and the taste of ocean shrimp. And it was extremely difficult to do, but with that collection of people, we were able to. Unlike, you know, Beyond and Impossible, which um, are pretty entrenched, and there's a lot of, you know, fake chicken companies out there right now, um, the alternative seafood world still is kind of like a last frontier. Um, it's been uh, taking far longer in development just because it is so much harder to create and um, meet what we expect. So this is a seafood in that there is seaweed. Seaweed is one of the core ingredients. And then for protein, we use mung bean, um, which works very well. And then also is more adapted, or I should say more accepted, versus soy which a lot of plant-based uh, proteins use. So we have none of the top eight allergens, uh, and that's obviously no shellfish, but also none of the top eight. So that's one of the, you know, one of the things that we have that really is, works well mm -hmm. in terms of acceptance. And then I really can't talk as much to the rest in that we have so much intellectual property. We currently have national distribution, so, yes, so we are partnering with Dot Foods, and then meanwhile we're sampling a lot and really in those initial stages with a lot of the national chains, um, the reception has been fantastic. It's been fantastic. I've tried a lot of these fake seafood products, and honestly, many of them really don't hit the mark. Shrimp, especially given that it's the third um, most eaten protein in all of America, is such a big volume of that, 
and you know is used in so many ubiquitous and different types of dishes that it's been really a holy grail for a lot of startups but new wave is a leader that has one of the best chances of really getting it to more of mainstream and commercial distribution Cafe Cafe is Kansas City's first Vietnamese coffee shop. So it is essentially a coffee shop on wheels, and we specialize in amplifying the Asian narrative by including all flavor profiles of Vietnamese coffee, and all of our coffee beans are from Vietnam. So before the pandemic, I spent 10 years in New York um, being an actor. I studied musical theater in college, and I did a lot of touring productions of various uh, Broadway shows. And most recently, right before the pandemic, I was on the Broadway revival tour of Miss Saigon. While I was on the road with Miss Saigon, I had taken a trip to Vietnam during one of our breaks, and it really inspired me to be a little bit more involved in my community and in my culture. So I'm a first generation Vietnamese Americans. I'm the first one in my family to be born here. So when I took the trip to Vietnam, it really resonated with me that there were a lot of things about my culture and a lot of things about myself that felt untapped. And while I was on the road, I kept thinking, I want to do something for my community. I want to do something that is more than a line on a resume, essentially. And I got the idea of starting a coffee shop because the coffee culture in Vietnam is just like incredible. It's super dope, but I didn't plan on doing it this soon. The pandemic hit and we were out of a job. So our show stopped completely. We were out of work and then our show got canceled like for real. So I didn't have a job to go back to. And at the time I was living out of a suitcase for like almost 18 months. Miss Saigon had come to Kansas City for two weeks. And while we were here, we were just enamored by the city. And I thought, wow, this would be really cool to start my coffee shop here, you know? So because of the pandemic, I didn't have anywhere to go. So we came here and I said, you know what? I'm gonna jump and let's just do it. It is a mobile coffee shop right now because during the pandemic, I wasn't able to receive a loan or any funding because everything was being shut down so much. I took every penny that I had from savings, which was like 10 grand. And then I also did a Kickstarter where I asked the community of Kansas City to essentially help me. And that's all. I started with that and I just did everything myself. I still do a lot myself, like 95% of it myself including like social media, photos, all the pop-ups, all of the labor, up until last month was all me. We started off, you know, sales were like really low because I was just doing a small lemonade stand. Uh, you know, essentially I was just setting up a table, having some Vietnamese lemonade and Vietnamese coffee at a table and like serving it that way just to get my name out there. When I first saw my balance sheet and I realizing we were really making a lot of money. It was almost a shock because I'm not used to big figures like that. And the the speed of which we got there, I mean, I'm just talking like within a month we doubled and then in a month we tripled. So that was crazy to be like, oh my God. Uh, not only is this becoming popular on social media, but on paper and like the numbers, it was actually becoming lucrative. You know, I could actually make a living. I could pay my employees, you know. It was a shock and it was also legit. At first, building our business was difficult financially because of the pandemic. Then it became difficult because we were so loud and we were so outspoken about being Asian. And we felt like the, the temperature of the country was just really unbearable because of all of the attacks. But what we found was that because we continue to be strong in our opinions and we continue to fight for you know the Asian community in town, we found that the community itself was so much more supportive than we could ever imagine. We, through a Stop Asian Hate vigil, 
for Kansas City, where over 500 people showed up and we taught everyone how to light incense. So we did a, an incense tribute instead of a candlelit vigil. Um, and that was just so magical and so amazing because we saw Kansas City come out. They were like, yeah, we, we wanna be there for you. We wanna show you that you're safe here and that we don't want anyone to attack you either. We felt targeted a few times. And so we've sh like closed down our shop to give ourselves just like some space to feel safe. But as a result of our vigil, Kansas City um, and the mayor of Kansas City declared May to officially be AAPI Heritage Month in the city of Kansas City. And we, as a coffee shop, were able to speak with the mayor that day. We got like an official decree. It was awesome. And so I feel like there's been good and bad with this shop, but overall it's just been better for us and we've helped the community recognize that hey there is a community here and it deserves to have a platform as well. Being an Asian woman and having a brand and a company where being Asian is at the forefront of our brand and of our company that's been so rewarding because I've gotten hundreds of DMs and messages and emails from other Asian people thanking me for doing this. And I, I knew that there needed to be more things and more businesses that made being Asian super cool. And I've tried really hard to build this brand to make other Asian kids out there be like, that's cool and I feel cool and I feel seen and I feel heard. So that's probably been like the most rewarding because we've created the space for that reason. We wanted to amplify the narrative within the Midwest where Asians aren't as heard or recognized and feel more invisible in these areas of the country. And being able to kind of look at my shop and be like, I did that. Like that's, that's really cool. It all started my passion for cooking. That made me uh, become meticulous about cookwares. One day I told Vivek, let's start our cookware brand, you know, the way we want, the, the material we can decide, the usability, how we want. I was like, okay, do you, we want to get into the metallurgy and manufacturing, let's do it, there's nothing to lose, we'll explore, we'll learn. And so we just got started. So that, that's how the Evercraft was born. We call ourselves accidental entrepreneurs. <laughs> it's been very natural. It's like we never thought this is as a startup or we are being the entrepreneurs. No, we have oh, to never, do this, yeah. we have to do that. We are going to design the cookware how we want and we have to sell it to the passionate cooks, chefs, mothers. There is a lot of thought that is gone in terms of usability, how user friendly it is. Because I don't think cookware was thought as can be user friendly. We only talk about the software or apps as user friendly. <laughs> That's the aspect we brought in cookware and we want to work more on that. Like how user friendly can this be? So we had to learn metallurgy. We didn't know anything about the metal composition, but we got behind it and we learned it. The steel that is used in the pan is, is much higher quality. And if some customer comes and asks us, we know what exactly happening. Because we know what we are making right from the composition of a metal till the pan, to the quality. Initially, we started from our garage. We used to get all the oh, yeah. cartons in our garage. We used to store in our garage and then we used to check each each and every product. every product. We used to sit like yeah. overnight Nights. and go Nights on checking Nights. because daytime used to be with kids and busy. But that taught us a lot about how a quality check should be on a product. Once it became like huge, like uh, container wise, then we have a third party logistics at uh, California, which works out better. Going back to 2015, our first year revenue was like $1,500. <laughs> that was our revenue. And we definitely made a lot more losses than that. Last year, I think uh, the goal we had set that we will do uh, two million, and we were like above a uh, little over two million. This year, and we are planning to double that. At home, it's not a business for us, honestly. It's it's something that we really love working on. Some of our friends and and people ask, like, how is it, like, husband and wife working, and then how is the personal life? 
we never really have felt it actually no. we just enjoy yeah. this journey we never felt that it's a personal and the professional life is different because as we share both the same dream and same, same goal passion, same, same passion dream. and people are so important in startup yeah. that your co-founder your teammates it's less about their technical skills it's more about their attitude and attitude. mindset yeah. that's really important yeah. and you get it at home i mean you know each other for longest you know the strengths you know the weaknesses and if you're able to tap into it i yeah. think great this is the this is the best school that you can give it to your children yeah. to your kids are there going to be challenges there will be challenges just go with the attitude of you will figure it out you will find some solution and you will find some no matter how i do it and no matter like what population i'm doing it for i've just always known that like my purpose is to feed people i'm laura katz i'm the founder and ceo of helena i'm 29 years old and i'm a food scientist at Helena we're recreating all of breast milk's most valuable components starting with the proteins found in breast milk with the goal of bringing parity and health outcomes for formula fed infants with our product so we're helping bring immunity to formula using the protein technology that we have I have been working in food since I was like 10. So when I was really really little, I started catering and just bringing as much food to people as possible. And throughout my career, I've worked all throughout food, but really working as a food scientist over the past 5 6 years to develop all kinds of different food products. And so for me, being able to bridge that gap between women's health and food science was such an important opportunity. I teach food science at NYU. I've been teaching there. I started when I was 24. A lot of the students I've taught have been older than me, and so it's been a process of figuring it out, but I knew that, you know, I had the ability to take that energy and be able to kind of insert it into how we can use it to advance women's health and infant nutrition. We're building a global brand, and so I want to change what nutrition looks like not just for infants but for all different kinds of population and just change how people think about what they eat that is something more functional and provides immunity to them My name is Embrain and I'm the founder of Simply Matai, a little Matai shop here in Chicago. Matai is actually a traditional sweet in India. Like any type of happy event that happens, you get Matai. You graduated from kindergarten? Great. Matai gets celebrated. But then in America, we just don't really have those many options. My kids, they don't like Matai. Indian Matai, no. And all my cousins, everyone's kids, they don't like the Matai. Our generation is moving away from a lot of the standard matai and i just wanted something that's like a beautiful box that i'm proud to like give to my friends and family when we're celebrating an occasion the one you get it here is not that fresh or not that made properly like that so in fact i then i told her let's do the infusion american and indian So our signature item is like these little box of chocolates and the bonbons are filled with the traditional Indian sweet called barfi. We created the recipe together and then I made the box of chocolates. So she brought the east and I bought the west. I grew up in India. I was born and raised there. But then I went to Saudi Arabia because of my husband got the job there. So We went there and we stayed there for 14 years. So she went to culinary school in India. Um and growing up in Saudi Arabia, my mom always made cakes. Like it was always a cake for all of our birthdays and she would like do this elaborate thing and um it's funny there's like pictures of it now as like growing up but that's like one of my main memories is always like my mom making a cake and she'd always like write on it and I was always amazed by that I used to create you know whatever they tell me they wanted some cartoon or whatever they wanted I used to create them and they used to be very excited growing up My father when we moved to America, he uh was working really really hard. He was an architect back home, but when he moved to America, he was in a licensed architect. So he was really making like $30,000 a year bare minimum. 
we were struggling. With four kids, I have four kids, two daughters and two sons. So we were struggling and my, only my husband was working. So we have to meet the ends. It was very hard for us to do anything. There was a time when his company decided that they were paying him too much and they decided to lay him off. He felt heartbroken that he was just like, I can't believe this, what am I gonna do now? But then once he finally was laid off and kind of forced into this position, he ended up um, like flying because he was like, okay, let me do this, let me do that. And he explored with so many of his entrepreneurial desires and he ended up being so much more successful and so happy. But then six months later, he was diagnosed with cancer and passed away. This all happened during my senior year of college. And when I graduated, I was working in finance. And I just kind of like looked around and I was like, this isn't what I want at all. I'm like, I don't want to spend like, you know, 13 years down the road and be in the same position my father was and pass away or, you know, who knows what tomorrow holds. Um, so that was my main thing as to like why I decided culinary school and why I decided that I just wanted to pursue something I actually enjoyed versus numbers. <laughs> Do you think that now you and your family have reached the American dream? Not yet. Sky is the limit. <laughs> so, I don't know. We want to do it more because I want to encourage my kids to do more and more. I'm so grateful for all of the opportunities that I've been given. Like, being able to go to college and succeed in my corporate life as much as I have, but then also have the ability to start this business and be able to just have zero limitations, literally the sky is the limit, to be able to do whatever I want with it and to expand as much as I want and just succeed if I choose to continue to do so. Or if tomorrow I decide not to, I can do that too, right? Like, it's just a beautiful thing to be able to do that. So to me now, the American dream is just living, just living a fulfilling life without any restrictions. <laughs>